Hello, and welcome back to another special edition of GNAT TV's In-Depth Series. I'm Andrew McKeever, the News Director at GNAT TV's News Project, and it's a pleasure to have you with us today on Wednesday, February 23rd. Also a great pleasure to join, uh, be joined today for this special show by my friend and colleague, Greg uh, Sukenik, who is a reporter with the Bennington Banner, Manchester Journal, and Brattleboro Reformer. Greg, good to have you along. It's wonderful to be here, Andrew. Thank you very much for making me a part of this. My pleasure. And uh, I'm sure all of you are watching. I've already understood very clearly now why this is indeed a very special edition of our program. We'd like to think that all of our guests are special, but uh, our guest today truly fits that, uh, that category. Senator Patrick Leahy is uh, joining us today from uh, CCTV, uh, our sister station up in Burlington and the Community Access Network. Uh, Senator Leahy, great to have you with us. It is a pleasure and an honor to have you on our program today. Well, it's great to, to be here. I was looking forward to this with everything that's been going on in the country. I was, I was keeping my fingers crossed. I wouldn't have to cancel coming home. Both Marcel and I were wanted to be home and it feels so great to be here. Well, we're great to ha very grateful to have you with us today and uh, to tell us a little bit about what's going on in the Senate and some of your reflections about the 48 years that you've served Vermont in the U.S. Senate, uh, a remarkable career. And I thought that might be our, a good starting point for our conversation today. Uh, and just take us back to 1974 and, and tell us what prompted you to run for the Senate uh, uh, in the first place. You were the... Uh, district attorney or state's attorney for Chittenden County at the time um, and ran against uh, uh, Representative Dick Mallory uh, and won in a very close race. So, but how did, uh, how did the thought uh, arrive uh, to uh, take that jump? It was an interesting time. I had, uh, you know, I was born in Montpelier. I went to law school in Washington, Georgetown, and I I was, was fascinated to walk up to the Capitol, sit in the gallery, watch the Senate, 100 uh, people debating issues that were fascinating to me. And I thought, uh, man, I'd love to be here. I know I never would be because we were the only state in the union that had never elected a Democrat. Uh, we had, since the popular election of senators, had never elected anybody under 50. I was a 34-year-old, uh, 33-year-old when I announced uh, Democrat state's attorney. Uh, and when I when I first said I was going to run, I assumed I was going to be running against Senator Aiken, who had basically uh, run unopposed the uh, uh, last couple of times and been elected to a partial term his first term, but he's elected the year I was born. And uh, everybody pointed that out and said, kid, go serve in the legislature or city council or something for a while before you run for the Senate. And then uh, we had a poll that came out. I've, I've only saved a couple of things written about me over all these years. This I have framed prominently. Two headlines. One big type front page. Poll dooms. Leahy. It's five days before the election. It was not an enjoyable weekend. The next one was Leahy unexpectedly wins. And um, I was grateful as a, uh, you know, as both Marcel and I are born in Vermont. We had campaigned. We didn't have much money to run. We just campaigned all over the state. But you know what I found that was most enjoyable campaigning, but also listening. I I got more ideas from more people, Republicans and Democrats alike around the state. And I thought, when I go down to uh, Washington, I'm going to make those, I'm going to uh, use those ideas. And I've never, I've never doubted that's some of my best ideas. I've had have come from Vermont. Building off of that for a moment, um, of, of, and perhaps some of those Vermont ideas might have fueled uh, the legislation that over 48 years uh, has had the most impact on Vermont. Uh, when you look back at your career, uh, 
what legislation that you've been part of do you think has had the most impact on Vermont? Well, it'd be hard to pick one. There's been so many. One of the things, one of the things I did, I've been there about two years, and uh, I asked to go on the appropriations committee. And at that time, usually some of that junior couldn't go on there, but there's not going to be anybody from New England. I made a strong point for it. The um, senators who were in charge of that said, you know, you don't get any publicity being on appropriations. It is the most powerful committee, but you you don't get any publicity, but you can do a lot for your state. I said, that's why I want it. They said, well, you're a workhorse, not a show horse. We'll put you on. And I combined that with the work I was doing on, on agriculture, which I went on. And there are so many examples. Let me give you one example. It came from southern Vermont. Uh, Marcel and I were sitting around a farmer's kitchen table, just chatting. Uh, having, as I recall, having a piece of delicious pie and talking to them. And they talked about organic farming, which I didn't know that much about. They said they they do it, they believe in it, but there are no federal standards. I said, let me go back and work on that. So I went back and the then uh, head of the committee was totally opposed to that idea. All the big, uh, powerful agriculture interests are totally opposed to it. He said it's a, it's a nothing kind of thing. So I kept working for two years. I kept going around Vermont, getting more ideas, going to Republicans and Democrats, sitting down, talking to them. Anyway, long story short, uh, I took over the committee. We passed the organic farming, and this nothing uh, legislation is now a 55 to $60 billion uh, nationwide industry. We've seen it down in uh, what it's done in, in Brattleboro and, uh, and in Wyndham County and others, bringing these things in. I'm pretty proud of that. And I'm pretty proud now to uh, go back here a couple of years ago, sitting around uh, uh, again, one of those kitchen tables. And I mean, a young farmer said, well, you know, by golly, Pat, you did something right there. And, uh, and it feels very good. But then you can also balance other things. I, I, I mean, Vermont, uh, the ladies came to Vermont in about 1850. Uh, I was the first one to get a, a college degree. My sister, the second one. But our ties are here. And you remember... Hurricane Irene, and how badly that hit down in the southern part of the state. The day after Irene was a beautiful day. But I went in a helicopter with the governor and the uh, adjutant general. We flew around southern Vermont. Uh, we had the door open on the side. I, I'm an amateur photographer. Of course, I strapped in, but I'm taking pictures. I was in tears when I was seeing a farmhouse. On one side of the river, normally, now it's on the other side, upside down. Uh, bridges twisted like a child's toy. And I said, we have got to help. I took those pictures. Uh, I called other senators from the airplane for help. I called the White House. And, uh, and then I took the pictures on the Senate floor and argued for money for Vermont. And they they were talking about the amount of relief we get in Vermont. I said, I want at least three times that. I went down to the White House. I met a couple of times with President Obama. I'd bring the pictures in. I do remember it was kind of humorous. He said one time, I hear about Vermont being such a beautiful state. All I see is all this destruction. Is that all you've got? I said, I thought you might ask. I pull out another one. As a beautiful foliage picture. He said, okay, that's better. But we got the money. And But it, it wasn't just the money I saw. People I'd never met before just pitching in, helping, working. We put our state back together. Uh, and I thought to myself, man, 
that I'm glad I'm here, that I could do that. Mm. As you look back over the nearly 50 years that you've served in the Senate uh, and thinking about all the legislation that you've worked on, um, how how do you feel Vermont has changed as a state uh, since ni- the early 1970s? Uh, I mean, there's been a lot of uh, a lot of things that have come and gone since then. But uh, as you reflect back on the state, is the as the culture of the state uh, different from what it was back then, or are we still kind of tracking along in the in the same way? No, there there have been changes. One thing that has helped is the the in most parts of Vermont the neighborliness. I mean, I could walk into and, and Marcel and I often will just stop in to a small store in a town going through and pick up a ice cream cone, a, a newspaper, and people just stop and talk. They don't care whether they're Republicans or Democrats. They'll ask questions. They'll give you their ideas. Uh, it's usually on a first-name basis. And I don't think you can see that. You couldn't do that in California. You couldn't do that in uh, uh, Texas. You couldn't do it in other big states. You can here, so that's still there. But I've also seen uh, more acceptance of people in Vermont. I think the fact that we've had refugees have come in here and have been accepted, uh, we've become a more diverse state. Look at our last election. People talk about, uh, they make this big thing in the presidential election. Oh, were they honest? Of course they were honest. The person who lost didn't want to consider the honest, but they were. And one of my the senators uh, was in the other party was saying, "Well, uh, you want open uh, elections just to elect Democrats." I said, "Let me tell you about it. We have the most honest, open elections in the country in Vermont. Jim Condos is stepping down as a national example of what a Secretary of State should be." And what was the last election? We elected a Republican governor, Phil Scott, a Democratic lieutenant governor, Molly Gray. Uh, we believe in voting. And we had one of the highest voter turnouts in the country. So we, we're no longer just a one-party state. We have seen that evolution. I've seen more people coming into Vermont, which is good. It's increased diversity. And I think what we've done with refugees has been helpful to our state. Uh, I I wonder what my great-great-great-grandparents felt like when they came here from Ireland during the potato famines in the 1850s. It was probably or my Italian grandparents when they came here around 1900. Uh, They had to face a little bit of difficulty acceptance. Today, it's an entirely different state. Uh, I can't think of a, a state I'd rather live in. Uh, along those lines, talking about Vermont's political culture and its acceptance, um, lots of folks sort of point to Vermont as an example, perhaps, of how um, Congress used to be and how they wish that Congress would sort of get back to. How did the United States Congress become so dysfunctional and, 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 and what's the path back? I don't think a day goes by that I don't ask myself that same question. Um, I've been writing a book, which will come out in a couple of months, and I have some things in that book, too, about it. I think a lot of this started breaking down around the time of Newt Gingrich in the House. Uh, you know, it used to be Tip O'Neill was the Speaker of the House. Bob Michael was the Republican leader. They would might argue cases on the floor, and then they'd go and have a cocktail together in the evening and just talk about family and kids and grandkids and so on and work things out. You saw the same thing with uh, people like Bob Dole and George Mitchell. Uh, polar opposites, but would work things out. Now it comes... It has to be winner take all, not compromise. And it's almost like in the Senate, I think they forget it's a six year term. People start thinking 60 minute terms. What's uh, 
what uh, uh, TV spot can I get on? Uh, what what uh, 24 hour news can I get on the next few minutes? And it's why I, I don't do many press conferences, unlike some of my colleagues. But it's also why I, I've been one of the most effective legislators in getting bipartisan legislation through. Because I said, Let, why don't we see what we want? For example, just before we left, got the uh, kept the government from shutting down with the appropriations bill. Now we'll get the big appropriations bill in the next couple of weeks. But that's taken months of behind the scenes work, evenings, weekends, by bring Republicans and Democrats into the office and say, okay, boys and girls, let's close the door, get out of your system. Now, how do we, how do we get this done? And We've got to go back to that. Too many people are, they say in the Senate, uh, you got 100 people running for president. Well, probably not that many, but you've got a whole lot of people that should pay attention to their work. And it has become too polarized. Um, social media has added to it. Uh, the idea that everything is yes or no, uh, it, it doesn't work. And, or you got to find, for, for example, I'll get half a dozen uh, petitions a month. You must sign on to this petition for this, you know, S1234, or we'll never elect you again. Well, I've, uh, I'm the longest serving member of the U.S. Senate at the moment. I don't sign the petitions. I'm happy to talk to people how I vote. I've also cast more votes than all but two senators in the history of the country, over 17,000 votes. I'm willing to stand up and vote. And I can look back on those and say, hmm, that's probably a stupid vote. But the issue will come up again, and I can vote differently next time. Following up a bit on that, uh, Senator, I was wondering uh, two big pieces of legislation that didn't make it uh passed the bar uh, in, a, in Congress last year were the, the Build Back Better bill and the John Lewis Voting Rights Bill. Uh, are those two pieces of legislation just dead in the water at this point and unlikely to kind of see any, any work on this coming uh, year or, or might it be possible to salvage at least parts of those pieces of legislation? I think the first one, Build Back Better, the uh, omnibus bill that my committee will pass in the next couple of weeks. We'll have some parts of it in there, and then we'll do the new appropriations bills, which have to be passed by the end of September for the next fiscal year. The John Lewis bill, uh, that not passing is one of the greatest disappointments I've felt in 48 years. This bill the equivalent of it was first signed by Richard Nixon, then by Ronald Reagan. I was there when President Reagan signed it. It passed, I believe, unanimously. And then George Bush. John Lewis was one of my best friends. Uh, I, I think of how honored I was when he came to Burlington a couple of years ago and spoke at the Flint Theater. And we had to do two or three sessions because the lines went several blocks down the street uh, to here. And uh, a man of soul and conscience. And I'm going to keep fighting until the day I, I leave the Senate to get it passed. I cannot understand how anybody, I don't care whether you're a Republican or Democrat, say, we have to do things that will block people from voting. I want everybody to vote. Marcel and I have actually done ads before my election saying, please get out and vote. I hope you vote for me, but even if you vote for my opponent, get out and vote. Uh, you look at what's happening in other parts of the world where 
dictators take over. There's no voting. People die. They fight. Everything else. To we have the right. Don't stop people from voting. And I want everybody. Uh, I want to think of my grandchildren. They grow up. I want uh, my white grandchildren and my black grandchildren to be able to vote. I I would hate to think that they would grow up in a country where they couldn't vote. Um, following up on that a little bit, um, I, I presume that you did you have conversations with senators trying uh, who uh, who didn't wind up who voted no or indicated that they would not vote yes. Um, and what was what seemed to be the um, the stumbling block, particularly for uh, for those um, in the in the Democratic side of the, of, of the of the Senate? I think most Democrats were for it, but uh, Donald Trump was against it, and yeah. a number of people didn't want to say no to Donald Trump. My thing is, and I keep saying this. In fact, that's why I got to, to the squabble with uh, Ted Cruz, who was saying that. I want this open voting because we want to elect just Democrats. And I use the example of Vermont, a Republican governor, a Democratic lieutenant governor. I said, I want everybody, everybody to vote. Uh, we fought wars to protect our right to vote. We've gone through the civil rights movement. John Lewis nearly died crossing that bridge. And, but he was willing to die to protect the right to vote. What does it say to us as a country if we are so afraid of voters that we're going to try to stop some of them from voting? That's immoral, that's wrong, and that is destructive of democracy. I, I, I mean, I, I can't emphasize it enough. This, I cannot think of anything that frustrates me more than denying people the right to vote. Uh, I remember as a little child growing up in Montpelier, my parents taking me by the hand to City Hall so I could stand with them when they went behind the curtain and voted. Uh, you just grew up thinking you had to vote. You know, I, I, I kind of think that years ago, I had probably the most interesting election in the country when Fred Tuttle, rest his soul, ran against me. Fred and I went around together and we went to we went to these schools urging people to get out and vote and uh, uh, telling the school kids, go with your parents and watch them vote. I mean, well. Yeah. Well, specifically, do you think you can change Joe Manchin and Kristen Sinema's minds and, and, and get this up for reconsideration? Do, do you think that that's that's possible or are they are they? I, I hope so. And I. We should not be filibustering the right to vote. We should vote on whether to have the right to vote. I mean, it's uh, to not vote on, on voting. It makes no sense. Senator, I wanted to uh, just pivot a little bit to uh, sort of current affairs. Uh, as we're talking today, uh, as you all well know, uh, we have a major crisis in Ukraine uh, underway, uh, and uh, you know who knows from one day to the next what's going to be happening. As I've uh, been thinking about uh, that whole crisis so as it's unfolded over the past couple of months, I, I find myself going back to the 1990s when you know the Berlin Wall came down, the Soviet Union collapsed, and NATO expanded into Eastern Europe, uh, uh, having countries that used to be part of the Warsaw Pact uh, join NATO, and that was perceived, I, I clearly perceived by President uh, Vladimir Putin as a, uh, an existential threat to uh, modern-day Russia. Uh, do you think it was a mistake um, for that uh, expansion of NATO to have occurred in, in the 1990s? I believe it was 1997 when that happened. And then, uh, if, it, if it was not, I mean, uh, what, what are you... What do you feel would be the best steps forward as as this uh, ongoing crisis un unfolds? Uh, do do we have a commitment to go and help Ukraine? You know, I, I go back and forth on the NATO expansion, and as you know, in the past um, several weeks, some of the most brilliant writers on foreign policy have been both pro and con on the 
question of uh, NATO expansion. I think I think the former Soviet Union felt it was a huge de defeat when so much of the Warsaw Pact uh, world left, and I think it was wise for us to offer assistance. In some ways, the jury is still out whether it's wise for us to make them part of NATO without strengthening our own role in NATO. But having said that, what um, Vladimir Putin is doing, he's thinking of himself as a modern-day czar. He wants to restore the glory of the Soviet Union, not realizing there wasn't that much glorious about the Soviet Union when you think of the pogroms and whatnot under Stalin and the rest. Uh, you think of an economy that nearly collapsed. Now, he has become one of the wealthiest people on Earth. Uh, I'm watching some of the satellite shots of his uh, hundreds of millions of dollars yacht being moved back away from uh, Germany. He and his his oligarch friends have billions upon billions of dollars. They stole billions on the last Winter Olympics that they had there. Uh, and with him, he has this vision of leaving as the return of the almost Sardom. Well, I wish you'd look back and see that kind of collapsed. And I am... Surprised that uh, uh, Xi in uh, China has not pushed back more. I, I think you can assume Xi told him not to, if he was going to invade, don't do it till the Olympics were over. And I think it uh, doesn't take uh, much uh, speculation to figure that happened. But now the question is, uh, Xi is thinking, does this make Russia more or less of a threat? Uh, part of them may be thinking, well, this will have them so extended on the economics and everything else that uh, China can continue what they're trying to do in expansion uh, throughout the Pacific. But it also might embolden them to say, well, if he could do that there, why can't we do that in Taiwan? And I, I think, you know, I, I'm going back to Washington a couple of days earlier uh, because I can get as one of the things about being third in line to the presidency, I get these much greater in-depth briefings. I don't know if that's a good thing or not. Sometimes I walk out of there, I'm like, I wish I hadn't heard that. But uh, I will go back for briefings all this weekend. I think President Biden has taken the right steps. He's been very, very measured. Uh, uh, Secretary Blinken was wise to cancel any meeting with the Russian foreign minister. And um, I, I think it is. I think it's going to be a real threat not a military threat to Europe, but more than an existential threat to Europe, the European economy and the European people. I, I, I think this is one of the greatest threats we've faced in a long, long time. I, I wish I could give you a happier view, but uh, I, I keep reading my material and I'm just, it is, it is really discouraging to watch this. And I think of the people, uh, Ukraine and Kiev and all. I, I've been there. I've, I've seen these people. I've seen the young children playing in the playground. I walk by some of the historic sites and seen people, uh, families walking. And I think, why devastate them? Certainly, what the United States might face from the immediate the, in the immediate um, future of this crisis is is less than what the Ukrainian people are are, are uh, possibly facing. Uh, but there is potentially um, 
additional impact on an economy that's been still trying to recover from uh, from the COVID pandemic. And speaking specifically about inflation and um, how the uh, the price of oil might be affected by by Russia being in an armed conflict. Um, your thoughts about what the United States government can and should do to try to limit the growth of inflation? Well, I think inflation will will continue at least in the short term. Uh, and you're absolutely right what you just said about oil prices. That's going to have a, a big influence on it. And we we feel in Vermont with heating heating prices, and most people have to commute back and forth to work. So uh, we're feeling it. Uh, I wish we would go back and put into some of the things like uh, child credit uh, for for schools. Uh, we've got to help people of uh, well, one find jobs, but we should be investing more in affordable housing in the United States that not only creates jobs, but it helps create stability. We should not close down the U.S. because this is happening. Uh, we can do two things at, at once. And I think that we have to go back to look at some of the things that affect us in health care, in child care, especially. I mean, that's why uh, all the things I've done down in, in the southern part of Vermont with the community block grants and, and uh, historic preservation and, and, and all that, I keep pouring those th- things in and trying to do it because it creates jobs, it creates stability, and you these are things you just can't turn it on and off at a moment's notice. Greg, uh, I think we each have time for one more question as we uh, okay. need to wrap wrap our, uh, this uh, discussion up here. Boy, this has been fascinating, uh, uh, Senator, and, and, I, and I have about 30 questions I could think of I'd love to ask you, but uh, uh, there's one in particular I thought might be kind of interesting to hear your views on, and that's about the, uh, the U.S. Supreme Court. You were a member of the Judiciary Committee uh, for uh, many years. I'm sure you've watched that process. Uh, it seems like the selection process and the nomination process for uh, justices of the Supreme Court over the last few years has been, uh, well, it seems, it seems anyway from the outside to have been a little different. Uh, but I guess what are your thoughts on that? Uh, uh, are, we, uh, are we going down a, a, a slippery slope on this, or, or is, is this just sort of one more piece of a very long-term cycle that will eventually take us back to... Uh, a process that might be more recognizable from for someone from the 1970s, 80s, or 90s? Uh, I have right. I, the slippery slope is right. Uh, I think it's a New England understatement when you suggest it's a problem. I voted on every uh, Supreme Court justice since John Paul Stevens, and I voted for Republican nominees and Democratic nominees. I voted for people who thought to keep the independence in the court. The uh, Last three nominees were put in under political fanfare. They were put in there to be uh, politicians. Maybe they're bright people and all that. But if you come in with an agenda, a political agenda to the Supreme Court, it hurts the court. I think that uh, uh, you lose the credibility of the U.S. Supreme Court. We lose one of the mainstays. Well, our third branch of government. Uh, and I am very, very concerned about it. I've had, as a young lawyer, I've had cases before federal courts, district courts, courts of appeals, even had one go to the Supreme Court and one on, one on motions. But uh, I worry the credibility of the Supreme Court is going. I think as a young law student, Marcel and I had lunch with Hugo Black, former Ku Klux Klan member, talked about when they wanted to do Brown versus Board of Education. The Chief Justice spent two and a half years bringing it up until he knew he could get a unanimous decision because the United States would not be able to accept something as groundbreaking as desegregation unless it was unanimous. Now we have five to four, five to four, five to four decisions. 
it is hurting our country. Um, and I, I worry, as a lawyer, as a, as a member of the Supreme Court bar, I worry very, very much about it. I wish I could tell you something happier, but, uh, and as former chairman of the Judiciary Committee, where I preside over two, uh, two Supreme Court nominees. Now, I've met uh, a couple of times with President Biden as have other members of the uh, committee. Uh, I know he's thinking on this next nominee. I am delighted to see it. Uh, another woman on the committee is an excellent idea. And a woman of color is an excellent idea uh, because it's not I mean, Ted Cruz talks about, I don't mean to keep picking on Cruz, but he talks about, oh, this is a terrible thing to say to these poor men who should be on there. Well, his history of uh, uh, being anti-women and uh, all is, is so well known, we can ignore that, but it's not like President Biden's going to pick somebody who's not qualified. I know the people he's looking at. Any one of them would be eminently well qualified to be on the U.S. Supreme Court. And any one of them, I'd be confident uh, in having them there. So I guess I get to ask the last question. Um, and just thinking about our conversation, uh, which has been fantastic. Thank you so much for it. Um, we talked about Irene, we've talked about energy prices, we've talked about the potential for economic growth. There's a common thread that runs through that, climate change. And I wonder about whether um, what you see is the, the road ahead um, and, what you would, and what you believe Congress can achieve to, uh, to make the United States a leader in, in addressing climate change again. That's a very good question. We've got to stop talking about Oh, this climate change is coming up in a decade. It's here now. And uh, uh, when you see the possibility, for example, our coastal areas, the, the water rising many feet, what's that going to do to our coastal cities? But also what's it doing to our, our quality of life? No, we, we've got to start fighting for it right now. And I think it means... Uh, taking steps, not just the United States. I mean, we, we try in Vermont, but we're 625,000 people. In the whole United States, but all these other countries have to. Uh, ocean pollution, the stuff that's dumped in there, plastics and other things. We're, we're reaching, we, in some areas, we're beyond the tipping point. So, no, I think it's a major thing. Again, I look at some of the steps we've taken. I, I mean, I don't mind really going back to this, but one of the reasons I uh, I added uh, thousands upon thousands of acres to the Green Mountain National Forest, actually about a, a third, increased it by about a third, and because that also helps with climate change and helps our state. And but that's going to be done all over the country. We can do it. I think you scratch a Vermont or Republican or Democrat, you usually find somebody who cares about the environment. I wish the heck others did. Well, uh, Senator, uh, again, uh, thank you so much for your time today. Well, I guess we're going to have to leave it there, although three questions I was dying to ask you about were about the Grateful Dead, Batman, and your photography uh, interest. But we're going to have to save those three subjects, I guess, for the next conversation. Just keep on trucking. <laughs> All right. We'll do that. Okay. Thank <laughs> well, once again, thank you, Senator. Uh, really appreciate your time and uh, what a fascinating conversation this has been. Uh, and to all of our viewers, thank you for being with us today for this very special program. I'm sure you found it as interesting as all the rest of us did. And, well, we'll see you again the next time. Meanwhile, have a great day.